Thank you very much for your first performance of this year and looking forward to many more. When I heard the news that grief expert Elizabeth Kubler-Ross died, I didn't believe it. I bargained with God saying, I'll be a more caring pastor if only she were still alive. And then I got angry with God for taking her away from me, which left me in a state of depression. But slowly, I am coming to accept her death, and I am grateful for the lessons that she taught the world. She's most widely known for her book on death and dying, which has been a classic for over 30 years. She took the radical step of actually listening to patients as they were dying to find out what was going on. She identified five stages of grief, denial, bargaining, anger, depression, and acceptance. And this language has entered into the pop culture and is perceived as some as a prescription of how to grieve correctly. <laughs> Are you still in denial? Certainly you should be in bargaining by now. <laughs> Actually, Kubler-Ross was not prescriptive in saying what the dying experience should be. She was descriptive, sharing what she had heard. But her work remains instructive as we face the many losses in our lives. Not all the stages happen all the time. They do not happen in a neat sequence, and sometimes more than one is present at a time. Three years ago, our nation experienced a great loss. Two planes crashed into the World Trade Center, one into the Pentagon and another into a field in Pennsylvania. When I saw the plane hit the first tower, I thought of terrorism, but reassured myself that it probably was an accident. The second plane shattered my denial. Some say that the attack shattered our nation's innocence. Though the victims on the planes and in the towers were innocent, our nation was not innocent. The terrorists had and have legitimate complaints about our foreign policy, but their means of expression is totally illegitimate. Plus, it is counterproductive. Their expression of anger only provoked more anger in us. Remember how angry this country was when 3,000 of our own were killed. Our anger was a legitimate human response to grief. And how we act in the face of our anger is important. Have we helped our cause by killing over 10,000 civilians? The insurgency in Iraq is not a crazy reaction by evil people. It is a human response by humans like us. Think about grief and the Kubler-Ross stages. It's generally felt that acceptance is the place where you need to get to. But in response to September 11th, is acceptance a legitimate goal? Not if it means accepting that we need to, we deserve to be attacked. Not if acceptance is that this is tolerable behavior. But we do need to accept the reality that we probably will be attacked again. We are fortunate not to have had a serious attack on our soil in the past three years. But that's more luck than government planning. Our ports, chemical and nuclear plants are still vulnerable. We've slowed in our fight against 
terrorists in Afghanistan. We have ignored the fact that most of the terrorists came from Saudi Arabia. And we have fostered terrorism in Iraq. We will be attacked again. It is as certain as the fact that all of us will die. All of our loved ones will die. Everyone will die eventually. Just as it is impossible to live if we are constantly worrying about our personal death, we cannot live in a state of perpetual orange or red alert. The next terrorist attack will happen no matter who gets elected. Acceptance of the reality of death and terrorism allows us to plan for them. We can reduce the likelihood of our immediate death by eating right, exercise, and we can reduce the likelihood of immediate terrorist threat by being vigilant, taking defensive measures, creating conditions in the world, and addressing the conditions of the world that have fostered terrorism. But we also need to live in the present moment and love and care for each other. If we deny the reality of death and terrorism, then we will be continually blindsided and our innocence will be lost over and over because it is an artificial innocence. Believe that I'm not going to die. Our nation will never be attacked again. And we'll blithely continue to live and do high-risk behaviors that make matters worse. Is bargaining an appropriate response to terror? Well, it depends on how it manifests itself. The manic singing of God bless America that had taken hold of this country three years ago still runs unabated. It feels like a desperate plea by those who think that feminism, multiculturalism, and homosexuality have angered God and they must beg for God to bless America again. The response has been a perverse, desperate attempt to protect our freedom by restricting our rights. But bargaining based on reality can help. Dick Cheney and President Clinton can probably protect their hearts and extend their lives if they agree, if they bargain, to stick with a diet and an exercise plan. But it's not foolproof. Both of them, like all of us, will die. Also, bargaining can be useful in regard to terrorism if based in reality. Being sensitive can help. <laughs> Actually talking and listening to our enemies and our friends is superior to lashing out in anger. Often, after a death, we are confronted by the things we might have done, whether it is national commissions, or just our personal reflection. There are two reactions of guilt and shame. Contrary to most liberals, I, I have a good feeling about guilt. <laughs> because guilt can be helpful if it helps us recognize the mistakes we have made and inspires us to act better in the future. But we must realize the limitations of guilt. It cannot change the past. 
If we try to change the past, we will be confronted by our powerlessness, and we will ignore our power to make the present and the future better. This wallowing in the past leads to shame, and shame leads to blame. Now, if we blame ourselves, it leads to depression. We believe we are bad people, and we believe that bad things should happen to us. If we blame others, and in this political season, that certainly is going around, it can lead to anger. We declare others evil and act as if it is impossible for them to be human and have a human feeling. These responses are normal, but we cannot let them overwhelm our rational thought. Blanket declarations of evil present, prevent resolution. Holding a grudge or despair can block our ability to enjoy life and build a better future. In a larger way, grief is a reality of our lives. And it is present all the time, not just when tragedy strikes. We are creatures of habit. We enjoy predictability. It helps us plan. But life is impermanent. It constantly changes. As our life progresses, there is always an undercurrent of loss. When a baby takes her first steps, she loses the comfort of her mother's arms. When a child enters school, he loses the freedom to learn at his own pace. When one graduates, one loses a community of friends. If we choose to be single, we lose the potential of a nuclear family. When one partner is chosen, potential partners are lost, or at least should be, if we want to. <laughs> Yeah. Love is not forever. One of you will change or die. Sometimes within months, sometimes after 75 years. Recognizing impermanence can help us cherish the present moment and increases the likelihood that another loving moment will occur, occur. Having children means a loss of time for the couple. If the child dies, it upsets our sense of how life should progress. When children grow up, we lose them as they leave home to pursue their own lives. And when we are fortunate, ourselves to become adult children, we face the loss of our parents. As they age, they may lose the ability to live independently. If we die young, our friends lose us. If we live long, we lose our friends. At any stage of life, grief is unavoidable. We can deny it, or we can learn to live with it. When we live in fear of losing our lives, we withdraw from lives. We are afraid to give. We try to keep our time, our treasure, and our passion to ourselves. When we realize that we're going to lose everything anyway, we might as well give it away. No longer bound by fear, we can live bountiful lives. The philosophies of the world tell of impermanence. From the Quran, all that is on earth will perish. 
and Sikhism, nothing is real but the eternal. In Judaism and Christianity, all flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. In Buddhism, by detachment from appearances, abide in real truth. Thus shall you think of the fleeting world, a star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning, a flickering lamp, a phantom, a dream. The Unitarian poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote, all things must change to something new, to something strange. Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, said nothing endures but change. And Confucius, they must often change who would be constant in happiness or wisdom. He speaks that we must continually be confronted with change and learn to adjust. Life is a series of of grasping and letting go. Will we cling when we should be letting go? If we do, our life will be a stream of loss and grief because we'll perceive that everything is being taken from us. But if we are prepared to give, we can let go with ease and be in harmony with the internal cycle of change. As a congregation, we need to support each other in the changes of our lives. We already have a grief, well, I have a support group for those experiencing separation and divorce. A new group is forming for those grieving the death of a loved one. But what are some of the other transitions that we can help each other with? New parents, empty nesters, the unemployed. If we use our imagination and we just look with compassion to those around us, we'll be able to think of many more ways to support each other through these changes. These groups can be opportunities to bring ourselves out of our own grief by giving to others in the group. Giving is a way to ride the waves of change. The prayer of St. Francis says, it is by giving that we receive. The Buddha said, if you knew what I know about the power of giving, you would not let a single meal pass without sharing it in some way. Lao Tzu, kindness in words creates confidence. Kindness in thinking creates profoundness. Kindness in giving creates love. And Sir Francis Bacon, in charity there is no excess. And finally, in Hinduism, what sort of religion can it be without compassion? You need to show compassion to all living beings. Compassion is the root of all religious faiths. Clinging to life strangles it. It is an illusion. The only way to prevent life from being taken from us is to give it away. May all our losses inspire us to give, and by giving, we shall live. May we bless and be blessed. Please rise as you are able and join in singing, What Wondrous Love Is This? <laughs>